we're meditating, which is a meritorious activity. Bunya is the Pali word. There's not a good translation yet. Maybe someday someone will come up with a good English translation. We usually translate it as merit. And it sounds like brownie points and merit badges. It creates an image of grasping at more happiness for yourself. And the way it is. But we're looking at happiness that doesn't create boundaries. Most ways in which people look for happiness creates boundaries, because if happiness is dependent on having a particular relationship with a particular person or a particular level of wealth, one person gains, somebody else has to lose. And that kind of situation is what creates boundaries, creates divisions. And as the Buddha said, it's a blameworthy happiness, because it depends on taking something from somebody else. Whereas the forms of happiness that qualify as merit, and the Buddha says that activities of merit are another name for happiness, help to erase boundaries. Generosity, you're giving something away to someone else, that creates a relationship right there, erases a boundary. When you buy something, there's a boundary. The fact that money has to change hands is what creates the boundary. But when what something is given, it, that boundary gets erased. The same with following the precepts. You realize that your well-being has to depend on not harming other beings. And so you don't kill, you don't steal, you don't have illicit sex, you don't lie, you don't take intoxicants. And that's looking after your own welfare. They benefit, you benefit too. In fact, when the Buddha talks about helping other people, it's basically getting them to observe the precepts too, because after all, they are actors, they are agents. And they're going to be reaping the results of their actions, so you want to encourage them to do things that will yield happiness for them. And that moves into the meditation which is also an activity in which you create happiness for yourself, and the fact that you're dealing with your greed, aversion, and delusion, trying to make them weaker, trying to make them less likely to burst out of their cages and go prowling around the neighborhood, other people are going to benefit. They don't have to be victims of your greed, or of your aversion, or of your delusion. So it's good to remember that as we meditate here, it's not just for us. We're doing, doing something that spreads its goodness around, spreads its happiness around, without any clear boundaries. Living as a monk makes this especially clear. Back when I was living in Thailand, there were times when I'd go for alms, and it was frequent. Some very, very poor people would put food in my bowl. This one couple in particular, I remember, it was just the two of them. they just recently gotten married. They had a little shack that was just big enough for the two of them to sleep in, in the rudiments of a kitchen out back. But every day there was some food in my bowl from them. I'd get back, eat their food, and warn myself, okay, today you're the beneficiary of a poor person's generosity. You can't be sloppy in your meditation. You can't be lazy. You've got to do this for them. But even as a layperson, sitting here meditating in the monastery, you're surrounded by people's generosity. The sala was built by people's donations. Everything inside here is a gift, so that we can benefit, so we can meditate, and that we can benefit others through our meditation. So try to keep that larger perspective in mind, especially when you feel like you're Tired in the evening, and you say, well, that's enough for tonight. You have to ask yourself, well, have you done a little extra for others? Is that enough? And push yourself a little bit harder. So we can repay our debt to others, and we can learn how to appreciate this happiness that spreads its goodness around.
So don't look down on the concept of merit. It's very, it's very useful. It's what develops that attitude of mind where you see that your happiness is not just yours, and there's no ironclad wall built around it, or it's not opened up to just a select few people. You realize that to be really, truly happy, you can't be doing anything that's really harming anybody else. And for some people, that's a hard lesson to learn. It takes a while. And so the fact that they're learning this lesson on that level, don't look down at it. There's a sutta where the Buddha talks about different motivations for being generous. And the lowest one, of course, is, you know, I'll get this back with interest. But still, that's a, that's a good motivation. It's better than saying, well, I just don't want to be generous at all. There's so much of that out there. So when people begin to realize okay, that if they really want to have wealth that lasts for a while, really want to have well-being that lasts for a while, they've got to share. And that's a meritorious motivation. Now, as you work up the levels of motivation, you finally get to the ones where it's simply a natural expression of the mind. You say, simply because it's good to do this, the mind feels refreshed. That too is a benefit you get from it. So don't look down on the idea that you're going to get something out of this or think that it taints your merit, taints the goodness of your actions. It's simply a matter of how refined your sense of how you benefit from the generosity, or how you benefit from the practice of virtue, how you benefit from the meditation. It just gets more and more refined. There's some Buddhist circles where people like to say, well, our meditation practice is totally pointless, and we're proud of the fact. But that's self-defeating. It means that they have to hide from themselves the fact that they are benefiting from the meditation. Or if the benefit meditation isn't really benefiting from them, they should look around. Maybe there are better ways to meditate. There's a part of the mind that always calculates, when I do this, what are the results going to be? Is it worth the effort? And thinking in terms of merit expands your sense of, well, how do you define worth the effort? If it's something that's going to be just short-term and just for me, well, that's perhaps one level of motivation. But you think there are lar larger terms, long-term benefits, long-term welfare, long-term happiness, blameless happiness. That expands your horizons. And it puts the practice of meditation into a different context. Many of us do come because we've got problems of suffering in our lives. Something's wrong. Something's lacking. Something's eating away at our hearts. We have the sense that meditation might be able to do something for that. That's a perfectly fine motivation for coming. And the Buddha's talking about the Four Noble Truths. Suffering was the first thing he talked about. And see, some people come and they have a particular problem that's been eating away and that problem gets solved and then they stop meditating. We see some of that. But in other cases, you see, as you take care of that particular problem, you see there's a larger structure to just the way we live our lives, the way we have bodies that age, grow ill, and die. There are dangers out there, dangers in here. And the damage that those dangers can do doesn't stop just in here. Even if it comes from in here, it can spread out. So you begin to see there's a larger issue here. And so your sense of what the practice is about begins to grow. Your sense of what constitutes well-being gets more and more refined. But there's also a sense of okay, what does make this worthwhile. Even the motivation for putting into practice the teachings on not-self. This is, leads to your long-term welfare and happiness. Think about the Buddha's definition of discernment. It comes from that question, what, when I do it, will lead to my long-term welfare and happiness? 
and your sense of what qualifies as long-term, and your sense of what qualifies as happiness, get more and more demanding as your wisdom grows. And part of the demands they make force you to turn around that the other part of that question of my, what when I do it will lead to my welfare and happiness. You begin to see that your welfare and happiness, if it's very narrowly defined, is going to be self-defeating. If it's more broadly defined, that's when it can take on energy. That's when it can take on life. That's when it becomes really worthwhile. But there is that calculation in there. Don't look down on that. Just learn how to calculate when is it worth the effort, because that's the question the Buddha has you ask all the way down, even when you get to the highest levels of the practice. And you realize that this sense of self that you've been straightening out as you meditate has carried you far, but there comes a point where it can, can't carry you any further. And that's the point where it doesn't become worth doing anymore, and your sense of self is a kind of doing. You've had many senses of self, many ways of doing them. You get more and more demanding about what you want to identify with, and finally you get to the point where an identity becomes an activity that's not worth it anymore. It's delivered you to the threshold of something much bigger. That's when it's not worth it. So this question of, is this action worth doing, is a question that you have to keep in mind all the time, and don't try to hide it from yourself. Simply allow it to mature and grow as you practice. And ultimately it'll take you to the point where there's no more doing anymore, there's no more need. But we can't short-circuit the practice by saying, well, I'll just go to that point first. No, you have to go through the stages of figuring out what kind of activities strike you as worth worthwhile. Put them into practice and ask yourself, okay, are these the results I really want, or do I want something better? As I would have said, the secret to his awakening was one, not being willing to give up his effort, and two, was not being content with skillful qualities. Listen to that. Things are good, but they could be better. He said that was the motto that kept him going and took him all the way. Otherwise, when you're just content with whatever little concentration you have or what little mindfulness you have, say, that's enough. That puts a stop to the practice. And we have to admit where we are and accept where we are as a starting point. But we also have to accept the fact that we have greater potential. And it is possible to do better. So we have to learn a mature way of living with that possibility, so we can make the most of it, not let it, get us, let it get us defeated, but actually to spur us on for effort that really does yield results, effort that really is worth the effort. As your sense of what's really worthwhile will continue to grow. <laughs>